we'll just take a very casual conversation. Uh, this is kind of a, a great opportunity to explore some cashless transactions or, or gain confidence in using some of the apps out there. So we'll definitely uh, be able to talk about that. So uh, I'm going to share my screen if I can just go ahead and get started. And of course, if you guys have any questions, uh, we'll go from there. All right. All right, how are we looking? Can everybody see Pay My Way in the Cashless Age? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so I just want to say before we get started, um, I know there was some mention of some uh, prizes that's being kind of interactive. I know a lot of our uh, registers, uh, registries, excuse me, were able to submit some questions. Um, I'll, I'll be able to touch on some of the questions that were asked as we go along here. But keep in mind too, if you text AARP to the number below 502-212-3167, you also have an additional opportunity just for joining us today to win some digital money, win that gift card. All right. Um, as I said, this is just really a casual conversation just to kind of break the ice about digital payments. Um, it can be intimidating. It can be confusing. Uh, there's a lot of words that fly around like cashless. Uh, digital, virtual, well, what does all that mean? What is the difference between all of those? Um, you know, and there's a lot of pressure right now, uh, the cashless age, there is a lot of pressure and demand um, on us to use these apps, to use these products. And if we don't understand them, it's difficult for us to feel confident using those services um, so, as I say, just sit back and relax, and whether you're new to digital payments or cashless transactions, or whether you have extensions on browsers and you shop like crazy and you're familiar with them, whatever the case may be, I hope you're able to just enjoy our time today. Um, and also, too, before I forget, any of us that are reflecting and celebrating this upcoming Memorial Day weekend, um, I just uh, wish you peace uh, for that. All right. All right. Time is money. The times, they are a changing. Um, I like to think that time is our most valuable commodity. Um, money comes and goes, experiences come and go, we make memories, we live our life, but the one constant there is time. And I think as we get a little bit older and as we navigate the demands of day to day, we really certainly realize how precious that commodity of time is. So cashless in the fast lane. Uh, you know, that's really one of the driving factors behind uh, getting used to cashless payments or, or using apps, digital apps. Um, it's fast, that's for sure, and it's cashless. And you can see I've noted here that there are many fintech options. And when I say fintech, uh, it's kind of one of those buzzwords. What I mean is the merging of financial industry plus technology, fintech. There's a ton of options out there to use. Um, we're gonna explore a few of those familiar uh, brands here in just a few moments, but there are tons of options, tons of options for consumers to use. Um, and each one of them can provide a different service. So that can be confusing, that can be intimidating. So there's a lot of options out there, okay? Cashless digital transactions, they are instant and frictionless. Um, so when we think instant and frictionless, think about this for a second. Put yourself at a grocery store. You ring up your groceries. And so now the cashier says, hey, okay, your total is $26.50. Well, you have a few options here. You can take out your wallet or your purse, dig out the exact change, give them $30, wait for change. Well, that's not frictionless. We've just had an exchange. Or we can write a check if they take a check. <laughs> Seems like checks are really just a thing of the past. So you could write a check if you wanted to. That takes time. Now the cashier probably wants to see your driver's license or your ID. Or we can pick up our phone 
that's already loaded with all of our digital content. And we can just wave it right there at the store. I'm sure you have seen it places like Kroger, Wendy's, wherever it is that you know you choose to spend your money at. Hey, Apple Pay is accepted here. Hey, use your use your phone right here to pay. So that's what I mean when I say instant and frictionless. It's very fast um, and it's very simple and easy to do. So growth in the pandemic. Uh, just reflect on the past year. Uh, 2020 was just kind of one of those unprecedented years. 2021, we're midway through, it's kind of shaping up to be the same. Um, just reflect on that past year and what changed. Think about things like touchless, contactless delivery, uh, the interactions between people, people want to limit those interactions and merchants certainly do too. Uh, so there's an increased demand for contactless payments and that those are that Apple Pay and Samsung Pay where you've already loaded your, you know, debit card credentials and now you're just waving that phone. So there's definitely growth over this past year um, that, that merchants and, and um, individuals alike they're demanding that we use these services because they don't want to have contact with us or they want to reduce the, you know, the touching between people, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> think about too, staying connected. Think about too, a lot of us may be utilizing financial technology and cashless payments right now. Um, I myself, I have prescriptions that I pick up at Walgreens and with the Walgreens app, I can request to have my prescription filled. All of my information is loaded. I want to go ahead and pay for that with Google Pay. My phone already has my information. Now I've went to the pharmacy and picked up my prescriptions. Didn't have to touch anything. It was all instant. It was all digital. And it's pretty safe, too. Um, so staying connected um, is, is one of those important things. <clears throat> Look both ways before crossing the street. Um, I think that's kind of one of the, when I received some of the questions uh, for these presentations, a lot of the questions were, hey, are these products safe? Hey, is it safe for me to use PayPal? I'm really concerned about security. I hear a lot of stories about things being hacked. Well, of course, when we look both ways before crossing the street, of course, we're going to be aware of vulnerabilities. I mean, we have vulnerabilities right now when we use checks, for example, our checkbook could get stolen. We could lose our wallet with all of our cash in it. We could lose our debit card or our credit card can get stolen. There's vulnerabilities right now. Um, and, and, that, and that rolls the same with um, cashless transactions or digital payments. So understanding the product and beware of those vulnerabilities. All right. Uh, so before we get into the crux of actually understanding and drilling down the differences, I wanted to definitely explore some popular digital options. Um, a lot of these are familiar brands, familiar icons, and you can see there's two different sections here. Digital wallets and payments, virtual payments and wallets. They sound alike. They both exist digitally, but they are quite separate. So when we first talk about digital payments, um, a lot of us shop online. You're hard pressed to find anyone who doesn't shop online. Even ordering pizza. Hey, you wanna pay with PayPal? You see PayPal pop up everywhere. And that's because PayPal is the most utilized um, transaction or, or digital service here. It's the most utilized product in the United States right now, PayPal. So when we think about PayPal, what is PayPal, for example? Well, PayPal acts as a house that has all of your contact information, your address, uh, your birthday, all of that fun stuff. And then you add in something of yours, like your debit card, your credit card, a line of credit, you tie it to a bank account somehow. So it's your money, it's just within this PayPal account. And so when you go to check out online at say Kohl's or Dillard's or something like that, you have some options. Hey, do you wanna pay with a gift card? 
Do you wanna pay with a debit card or credit card? Or would you like to pay with PayPal? PayPal is so popular. As I said, it's the most utilized uh, financial FinTech product that's out there right now. Um, the hardest thing and the most time consuming part of the digital space is actually setting up the account itself. Um, a lot of these um, service providers are free. A lot of these wallets, say for example, you see Apple Pay here, you see Android Pay. A lot of these apps are actually integrated and built in to a lot of these smartphones. If you have purchased a cell phone in say the past five years, there's a pretty good chance you already have loaded onto that phone some sort of digital wallet, Apple Pay, Android Pay. And the concept is the same, just as PayPal. You load your credentials and link up your bank account information or credit card information or however you would normally pay. You load this into a PayPal account then you're ready to go. You're ready to go spending and shopping with your PayPal account. Now, I know we'll explore some risk and um, some, you know, consumer issues and fraud and things like that. Um, but I did want to bring up one thing here. There is a difference between merchant payments and sending money. Uh, take Venmo. Venmo is the most popular app where you send money to and from someone. So if you have friends and you have family, you could use Venmo. Venmo is designed to send money to people that you know. Or PayPal, for example, is designed to pay merchants. There are some different consumer rules with the apps, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, but just making sure you understand that with all of these options, each of them do operate just a little bit differently, but the result is the same. Uh, with virtual payments and wallets, uh, got a lot of questions about Bitcoin. <laughs> oh, Bitcoin. Um, you'll see Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin. Uh, crypto and virtual is kind of a different beast. Where digital payments and wallets are basically digital versions of your debit card or credit card, that's your tangible money. You spend something with PayPal, you're gonna see that reflected. It's gonna come out of your bank account, right? Just like any other debit card or credit card. It's basically a digitized version of your assets where the virtual currency pay, or excuse me, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, things of like that, it acts more of an asset or an investment. And a lot of places aren't accepting uh, that right now. It's kind of more of a, a weird, like elite community uh, that are taking Bitcoin. Where PayPal, yeah, you'll see that everywhere. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is your financial institution usually offers great free services. For example, we have a, an, an app here at Class Act. You can uh, do bill pay, so you can pay all of your bills electronically. It's cashless and it's completely free. And then you don't have to worry about, is my information safe? You know, do I trust this company? It's your own financial institution. So don't discount utilizing some of the digital services that your financial institution offers. All right. So I, I know I fed a lot of info to you guys, and there are, as I mentioned, a lot of things to consider in the digital world, excuse me, but understanding these very basic concepts are, is going to take you far, especially if you lack confidence or you're just not sure. So just a few moments ago, we kind of looked at some different brands of digital versus virtual. Um, digital wallets versus virtual wallets. So that digital currency or digital wallets, we just talked about PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, things like that. That's actually money that exists in the digital space. 
That's your money. That's tied to your bank account. If you have a Samsung Pay or, or Apple Pay, that's linked up to whatever you deem it to be linked up to. So if you make a purchase using Apple Pay, for example, you're going to see that debit. That's your money. You're going to see it debited. You would reconcile it you know, with your ledger or however you do normally. Digital currency, again, because that's your money, you're just spending it digitally, it is valued at the present currency rate. So the exchange rate is, is valued as, as the basically think fiat US dollar right now. So if you're making a PayPal purchase at Kohl's.com and your purchase amount is $39.99 and you use your PayPal account to make that purchase because it's so easy and so quick, well, you can expect to see $39.99 come out of whatever account you've attached it to. So it is the, the value of the current U.S. dollar. <clears throat> so as we mentioned, digital is connected to bank accounts, lines of credit, things that actually belong to you or are associated with you in some way. Federally regulated uh, digital currency, as we said, PayPal, if you use money with PayPal, that's federally regulated. You're using a service that's actually supporting tangible real money. Um, so <clears throat> there is a say, a, a big, big growth to spend electronic wallets and services, being familiar with those, Venmo, Cash App. And it really works like this. You have your phone, you have the app store, if you know how to download Facebook or a poker game or Kroger app, same concept. You download whatever application or mobile provider you'd like to use, whether it's Cash App or PayPal or Samsung Pay, whatever it is, you download that through the app store. You Fill, find the, or excuse me, follow the prompts, put your name in, put your this in, put your that. Within seconds, you're ready to go. Where virtual currency, <laughs> cryptocurrency, it's a little bit different. It's, it's pretty complex. And it's actually based on a digital algorithm or software. And I think that's one of the hard things to kind of understand and make sure we understand the differences is between digital currency versus virtual. That virtual is really like a digital asset. When you buy into Bitcoin, I think one Bitcoin right now, it, it's, it, it moves like a stock market. It moves like an investment. The value fluctuates. I think one Bitcoin right now is going for some $46,000 is the equivalent of one Bitcoin. So it can be a risk uh, to, to involve yourself with virtual currency, but just remember it's based on a digital algorithm or software. There is nothing tangible. Uh, there is no gold value behind virtual currency like Bitcoin. Uh, so as I say, it's valued based by market interest and demand. And I don't mean interest in dividends as we're used to. I mean, interest as in uh, curiosity drive for that product. Um, big names can really influence it. I mean, you think just this week alone, Elon Musk, as soon as he says anything about Bitcoin or Dogecoin, uh, people, you know, it's almost like a snowstorm. They run to stockpile or they run to sell. So <clears throat> just making sure we evaluate the risk there. Um, virtual currency like Bitcoin, Dogecoin, it's actually earned by, simply put, figuring out math problems. Um, there's this whole technology called blockchain and mining that's far too complex for this specific presentation. Uh, but you, you, it takes a lot to earn Bitcoin. It takes a lot of energy to earn Bitcoin. It takes a lot of computing power to earn Bitcoin. So investment, uh, as I said, not just monetary, but time as well. It is not federally regulated. Uh, but you guys are probably seeing there's becoming more interest, say, at the Federal Reserve and, and with the IRS, there's <laughs> the tax interest, of course. So it's not federally regulated right now, but uh, who knows what the future will hold. Um, and as we talked about some of the popular cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, 
as I say, those can tend to run together. But the one recommendation that I have with virtual currency, Bitcoin, Dogecoin, et cetera, understand what you are buying, using, et cetera, with those. Uh, you Generally, you can purchase Bitcoin through either um, kind of an online collective or an online broker too. So it's not as simple as just paying on, you know, online with Dillard's with PayPal. Virtual currency is something completely different. Uh, so make sure that you research anytime that you do that. Uh, another simple reminder, text AARP to 502-212-3167 for a chance to win some gift cards. All right here, uh, just about wrapping up with uh, just kind of a general explanation of digital and, and virtual payments. I did want to touch on some digital trends for 2021. EMV chip card technology, we all now probably have physical cards, debit cards, and credit cards with that chip technology. That chip technology is like a digital fingerprint every time that you use that card. It's harder to duplicate a counterfeit card or it's harder to uh, it, it's harder to perform fraud on a card with the EMV chip card. Um, biometric authentication. Wow, that's really, really growing. Uh, the interest for biometric identification. And some of you may not even realize you do it every day. If you unlock a cell phone, say with a fingerprint, or some of the cell phones that you can open by showing your um, eye, your iris or whatever it is, anything that body bodily measures uh, to bypass, um, say a password or something like that, it's really becoming common. Mobile and contactless, we talked about contactless where you have the app already loaded into your phone and you're just waving those that phone you know, at the grocery store. Digital wallets, again, everybody's using digital wallets. Find one that you feel comfortable with, download the app, read those terms and services, read the terms of condition, use the app confidently. Um, it, it's so, they're so common. And if you're, you're not sure, there are tons and tons of resources. Um, I, of course, I would always be happy to help navigate, but there's tons of resources online too. And, and furthermore, as I said, do not discount your own credit unions or banks because they may be offering their own version of a wallet and they you know so you feel comfortable there because it's already your bank so don't discount that and again the virtual currency uh who knows what the what the future is for for items like bitcoin who knows which way the pendulum will swing um as i mentioned it's, it's kind of a more complex than just your average everyday type of transaction uh, but it is on the rise there is a ton of interest for it um so make sure you do your homework if you stick your toes in the virtual currency world if you choose to go that route uh, last thing, and I will uh, wrap up here, is I just wanted to share uh, this graph from eMarketer. I thought it was so powerful, and it really just kind of reflects the, the sign of the times here with mobile payment spending per user. You can see that 2021, we're going to probably peak here in 2021. The technology's here. The, everybody is, is using it. Um, so for percent of change, I think the people that are going to get on board, you're on board for the most part, or you're getting ready to get on board with mobile payments. So you can see that growth is just expected uh, to rise and we're expected to spend more and more digitally. So I uh, just thought that would be a, a great way to, to pull some of that basic understanding of those into perspective. And um, I really enjoyed speaking with everyone today. So thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Stacy, for that wonderful presentation. So now we'll move to move on to application risk with LaDonna Cabell. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, so my name is LaDonna Cobell and I I'm wondering, do I need to share my screen or do you all have my PowerPoint that you can put up? I'm not sure. I sent it. I sent it to Deb. I Will you all? Deborah has it. Yes, I've got it, but 
Do you want to do it or not? Can you share? Yes. Okay, you're, you're set up to share. Okay, I don't see it on my screen to share it. Let me see. Okay, so let me just go ahead and let me fill you guys in and um, we'll just we'll just do it the old fashioned way. We'll see if we can get it up there. And if not, I'll just roll through some of these. So I'm the director of the Office of Senior Protection. And what we do is we help consumers and businesses alike with fraud and scams. And a lot of things that come to us would be things, there we go, would be things such as um, identity theft and really helping people know how to recover from identity theft, how to protect their credit um, from, from getting used worse. I'm looking here, the screen, thank you so much. I don't see, is there a way to turn it over to me? I don't see a way to, advance. I'm so sorry, guys. That, so this is fine. If you can just keep doing it, this will be good. I so will. one of the things and every state will have a consumer protection office within their attorney general's office that will assist consumers. So if there are any consumers on the call who are in other states, what we all do is, is pretty similar. We're there to help you um, if you've fallen victim to a scam or a fraud. One thing to just know is at least in our office in Kentucky, we do not do landlord tenant issues or eviction issues, which sadly have been very prominent during the pandemic, um, but that's just not within the scope of our office. We just have two people for the entire state who really handle this kind of fraud. Um, so we're not able to do that. And we also do mediation services free of charge where we assist consumers who have a dispute with a business. Uh, without having to hire an attorney or um, get into, you know, legal disputes. We're sort of like the Better Business Bureau of State Government. We do very similar things and work well in partnerships with the Better Business Bureau. We can go to the next slide. So one of the things, and we're going to talk about just all of, all of how the scammers get you to send money and how they try to use cashless transactions so what they want to do is they want to get the money and have it in an anonymous way that you can't get back. Now, we still have consumers who will tell us that they mailed large sums of cash, $20,000, $30,000. Uh, our number one scam in 2020 was uh, the romance social networking scams where someone reaches out to you through social media and it might be a love interest or it might be someone that you think is one of your friends, but really it's a scammer who used your friend's identity to open a separate social media account. So that was our number one dollar loss was still um, romance. Extortion was big in 2020. Uh, I know what's on your computer. I'm gonna send it out to all your friends in your inbox if you don't pay up, if you don't send us money. Um, small business loan fraud, there was a lot of identity theft. One thing I wanna point out here is that these identity theft cases, 94% of those that were reported to our office were from people age 60 and older. So a lot of this comes from the phone calls, the phone calls that claim to be from the Social Security Administration or the other imposter calls that claim to be a government agency or Medicare. And you just need to confirm your Medicare number, which is your social, or your, or just give us your social, and we'll just we'll take care of this for you right now. There's some problem on your account, so that that was extremely prevalent uh, during 2020. So let me tell you a little bit about, um, and you can go on. Yeah. So th this is just going to show you the the prevalence of the, these scams and how they're getting people to send money, and if you'll. Yeah, stay right there for a second. So in this month to date, we have already had nearly the same number of dollar losses reported to us from people who've been victimized by scams as we had the entire year of 2019. So in 2019, you'll see there was $1.6 million in losses that was reported to our office. And in May alone, um, and this is a couple days ago, when I pulled these statistics, 
we had already seen almost 1.6 million in losses this month, not this year, but just this month. So it's, it's incredible how much scams are on the rise and you really have to be careful with some of the cashless transactions. So I'm gonna fill you in a little bit on that. The tactics of fraud and the way they're gonna get you to send the money. Really, they want an emotional response. They want you to think there's an emergency. You shouldn't call someone else. You shouldn't get a, a second opinion. They want, they want you to act now. You have to do this because your bank account is in jeopardy. Someone has taken it over. Let us take control of your computer and we'll fix it. They pretend to be from your bank or your credit card company. And a lot of people allow them, they're being very helpful. They're very friendly and professional. This is what they do full time. It's a billions of dollar industry. And so they convince people that they are who they say they are. And you turn over your computer and lo and behold, they get it working. They've gained your trust. But what they've done is they've installed malware or they have uh, gotten a hold of your bank account at this point. And what we find then is people's bank accounts can end up being, being drained, essentially. So the number one way that people lose money, a cashless transaction is gift cards. That's the, the biggest thing we see still are gift cards. And I think a, a close second would be wire transfers of large sums of money that they think they're sending to someone they know who they are, but really it's typically going overseas. Um, gift cards are for gifts. And the second you buy these gift cards um, and you take a picture of the back of that gift card to prove that you bought it, see this very often in you're going to be arrested scams if you don't. There's a warrant for your arrest. This is the U.S. Marshal Service. If you don't give us so much money, you're going to be arrested. You can pay, pay us in gift cards and people will go buy tens of thousands of dollars sometimes, um, even if it's $2,500, enormous sums of money. And they'll take a picture of the back of the card to prove that they got it so they won't be arrested. This isn't how law enforcement works. And it's, um, you know, these gift card scams are also very prevalent in senior uh, grandparent scams. And the way the grandparent scam works is they'll call and they'll, they'll do their research on you. They're going to know your name. They're going to know your grandkids' names. And they maybe know that you have a grandson who is in college. And this week, they know this because they're, they're looking at your social media accounts or your grandkids' social media accounts. And they see that your grandson is in Myrtle Beach this week. And so they call you with just enough information to make it sound legitimate. And they tell you there's been an accident. Someone was killed. Someone was injured. Your grandson's in an accident. Don't call your son or daughter. There's going to be big problems if you do. We can help him. He needs money right now. So they take all different twists. But these grandparent scams, very often, they want gift cards. We've seen a recent rise in other types of money and currency that they're wanting, but that's a, that's a very common one. Well, and, you know, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about Bitcoin. I just want to make you all aware. So those of you who are in Kentucky, a story ran earlier this week, I want to say day before yesterday on Bitcoin scams. It was on WDRB News and the Better Business Bureau and WDRB, which is a Louisville, Kentucky news channel. Um, presented a story and it's something our office sees. It's not uncommon that we will see this. And so these Bitcoin scams are growing. People still aren't real familiar with Bitcoin. And the biggest issue we see with Bitcoin are these investment scams. We can get you in, you can buy a bunch of Bitcoin and you're, you're gonna make a huge return on your investment. It's guaranteed, you can't lose out. And that's the story that WDRB shared. There was a lady in Louisville who was contacted by a friend through Facebook. She thought it was her friend. Really, it was an imposter account uh, under her friend's name, and it had the photograph of her friend. So she thought this was the friend. And they, this friend was telling her how much money she had made. 
um, buying Bitcoin and in one day made like $50,000. And all you have to do is put up this much money, you know, $13,000 and it's going to turn into all this money. And so she sent the money to buy into this Bitcoin um, investment and it, it's all a scam. Uh, they even had a screen set up showing how much money she'd made at the end of the day. There was $99,000 in her account that started off at like 13000 And by the end of the day, it was gone. Oh, somebody must have hacked it. Your money's gone. Gosh, sorry. So it's stuff like that. There's lots of scams going on. Just be very careful. Be very careful and know who you are sending money to. All of these are secure services, but... When you send money, but you're not really sure who you're sending the money to, the money's gone. So this love interest that you may think, and by the way, on these romance scams, there are probably some of us on the call who are thinking, how could somebody fall for that? Somebody I've never met in person, I'm not going to send $20,000. I'm not going to mortgage my house and send it. Well, here's how it works, though. What will happen before people, you know, wire transfer money, whether it's from a bank or through one of these services, is these scammers have invested months in a relationship. They have gotten to know them. There are intimate details. The victims of these scams, it's really um, multifaceted that they are being emotionally drained and um, also financially drained. So be very careful. Know who you're sending money before you ever do. But let's take a quick break and let's go to one trivia question. Uh, thank you, LaDonna, for your presentation. Um, before we go to the Q&A, let's have a little fun. We have learned a lot from LaDonna and Stacy. Uh, let's have a little fun with Dana's trivia. I don't think my presentation had the trivia question. So somebody else might need to plug that in. Uh, Dana, uh, there she comes. Okay. Hi, I'm Dana Moore. I'm a volunteer with AARP and the Louisville community team. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard so far and have learned as much as I have. I'm going to read a question. And if you put your answer in the chat section, you'll be entered into a drawing for a gift card. Don't worry whether the answer's right, although I heard it while uh, uh, Stacy was doing hers. We just want your participation. So here's our first question. What payment app uh, is most used by consumers? We saw a picture of it and uh, what payment app is most used by consumers? Oh, I see a lot of answers over there. Okay, I think most people got it. Well, we still got a couple more. It was PayPal. PayPal is the most uh, used uh, in the United States. Well, thank you, Dana. It looked like our winner will be Pearly Williams. Congratulations. So at this time, I know we all have burning questions. Um, I would like to start up, open the Q&A. So I have a question for uh, Julia. We haven't heard from you. We have all of this new uh, fangle um, trend going on about cryptocurrency and with these cash I mean, cashless uh, payments, uh, how does that involve taxes? I know when you deal with money, taxes come into play. So I, if you could, could you tell us a little bit about how that plays out? 
more and more the Internal Revenue Service is providing options for people to go online and to make the payments with their returns, as opposed to sending in checks and so forth. So I mean, it just kind of folds right into these options that, that they're providing and talking about today. So. Well, thank you. I have another question um, for one of you to answer. What are the pros and cons of using uh, the cashless payments versus using the bank? This is LaDonna. I'll just jump in here and then somebody else might want to jump in. Stacy might want to add as well. Um, one of the questions, it kind of ties in a little bit with this as far as what are the advantages of payments? One of the other questions that was very similar was what are some of the protections of some of these different types of payment services like PayPal? And um, are there kind of some, some risks there in how you pay for things? And I think one of the tips I would add here is that it's, it's a convenience factor. Um, people really like it. A lot of entities take it. Um, I know if you shop on eBay, eBay is very common uh, for using PayPal. But one of the tips I would have um, would be to tie your PayPal account to a credit card. And I'm not sure if this is true for all banks, but when you tie your PayPal account to your bank account directly, you're not going to have the same protections that you would have with a credit card necessarily. So that's one of the things you can do to try to help protect yourself is tie it to the credit card instead of um, instead of directly into your bank account. We haven't seen any situations where money was wiped, but it would give you some other protections. And I think one of the other questions asked something about um, the PayPal and what it covers, kind of how those protections work. Just be aware before you buy anything, what those protections are for the type of service you're using. Let me give you an example, PayPal. They have a page dedicated to what the PayPal protection covers and what the PayPal protection services doesn't cover. So for example, one of the things it doesn't cover, and we do get complaints about this, um, is it doesn't cover motor vehicles. So if you purchase a motorized vehicle on uh, a service like an eBay or something and you send somebody that much money through PayPal for to buy a vehicle, it's not gonna cover it, the PayPal protection doesn't. It also doesn't cover any purchases made in person. So if you're shopping on Facebook Marketplace and you're showing up at somebody's doorstep and you've just sent them money, you're not gonna get a purchase protection there. And the other thing on that is be careful how you send money if you're using PayPal or any of these services. They have a friends and family way of sending it. And then there's no extra charges involved. So if I wanna send Tanya $20, I can say she's friends and family and I can send the 20 and there's no fees. The problem is there's no protection either. So make sure that you're only using that for people you know personally. Well said. Well, thank you. Um, we have a question uh, concerning with hidden fees. Uh, nothing is free in life. So this, uh, person would like to know what are the fees and who pays those fees? I'll jump in here. So because there are so many options, uh, of course, e each one of those, depending on who owns them, has, you know, overhead and they have to, to keep managing the website or the app or what have you, just like any other business uh, for consumers it is the same, same thing there. So fees do vary. Um, however, a lot of these apps and digital places want to retain you. They want you to use those services. So a lot of common services are often free uh, for everyday shopping. Uh, PayPal usually offers, you know, free things. Now, that does not... Um, 
you know, it does not mean anything about your commitment to repay a credit card or anything like that. You would still be responsible for that. But as to, in terms of fees and, and charges, they do vary. Um, and uh, a lot of them sometimes are based on what do you want to do? If you want to use something instant, it's free. If you want something to process through another way, it may cost, you know, a small percent, just like a cash advance fee would with credit cards. So it really does vary. You have to make Make sure you're paying attention to what you're signing up for. Thank you. And I have one more question. If you um, order some merchandise and you don't get your order, who's responsible for recovering your payment? So I'll jump in real quick and then somebody else might want to jump in as well, but it depends on who you ordered it from. Let me give you an example. We were talking about PayPal protection. If you paid with PayPal and you ordered, for example, three shirts and you only received two, you can open a complaint with PayPal to figure out how to get that amount refunded. So those are the types of things that those protection services cover. If it's a credit card, you can um, open an account with a credit card as well to dispute, say you never received the item and to dispute the charge. Just um, one little tip I would give here is that keep an eye on your bank account card and your credit cards for any unauthorized charges because the best advice I can give you is just to remember you only have 60 days to challenge an unauthorized charge. So if for some reason your card account was stolen or something, um, that's something you would want to report. But usually you can open with any of these services of how you paid. If you don't receive the item, you can usually open an account or a ticket to get that resolved. Thank you. So let's have a little more fun. We're going to draw two names uh, randomly from our registrant and to present e-gift cards. And the two people that we pulled was Joyce Hammett and Gerald Reber. So congratulations to those two for winning the e-gift cards. And Dana, uh, would you like to do our last trivia question? Sure. Isn't this great? Now you're earning money or winning money and, and you don't have to pay out on this. I can, okay, here's our next trivia question. Can a payment app be used in other countries and is there an additional fee? So if you go to on vacation in Europe, are, are you able to use your payment app there? Just respond in the chat box. And you folks have listened, I can tell. Okay, yes, you, many financial um, payment apps do let you use it internationally. However, there's gonna be a difference. You might have to pay fees because the money is different. You know, the, the US dollar is gonna be different than the Euro. So you might have to pay some additional fees there. So just check your app before you, but you can use it internationally in some places. Thank you, Dana. So our final drawing for that trivia goes to Alice McHugh. Congratulations, Alice. At this time, I hate to say that we're approaching the end of this event, but I wanna say thank you, thank you to the panelists for their presentation and sharing your knowledge with us today. Now to our audience, Thank you for taking the time out to attend our event today and congratulations to all our prize winners. And of course, we all are winners because we know more likely now than we did when we first joined this session. And thanks to our panelists, thank you very much again. If your question was unanswered or you would like more detail, we will have a poll pop up when you exit this session. We ask that you answer it 
it so you can help us plan for future offerings to the community. And as a follow-up, you'll receive an email with a short survey on today's event. And we ask, please, we love your input on all of our events. Included in that email will be a link to view the event again. And please feel free to share it with others that wasn't able to attend today's session. AARP Kentucky provides events throughout the year. For more information, we ask, visit our website at www.aarp forward slash KY or our virtual community center at www.aarp.org forward slash Kentucky. This is going to end our session in just a few minutes, but I wanted to make sure to ask if you all enjoyed the session as much as I did today and all the important information that we gathered today. So don't everybody go out and just download those apps and, and start using them. Please, please be careful of how you do things and be aware if something is out of, out of the norm because we're coming off of this pandemic and people are out there to take advantage of us and especially our money. I'd like to thank you all again for taking time out of your day and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.